Welcome, Alexa, and thank you for coming today. And Alexa, just explain that she's sponsored by Two Steps Home, but talking about the Contagious Hope Network and Innovative Solutions to Housing in Toronto. Is that right? Yeah. I'm not completely wrong. Okay, perfect. I do want to say welcome to the Make a Difference Talk series. And this is organized jointly by St. Matt's United Church, Bloor Street United Church, um, Holy Blossom Synagogue. And we'd be connected with Tina uh, from Davenport Perth um, Ministries as well. And we'd love to have more collaborators and more people to share the recordings of the talks with and invite people to and have help with the speakers because I think that the that these topics are universal and very connected and growing the network would be a wonderful thing. So we're so pleased to have Alexa here this afternoon and um, really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So thank you. Thank you. I am grateful that there are people who will take a Sunday afternoon to talk about this important topic. Um, last night, I was trying to get some sleep because I was going to get up early and preach. And I got a call at 930 from uh, a newcomer who said, Pastor, please, I'm stranded. I've knocked on the doors of the uh, warming center and they've said we are full. And so this is um, a pressing issue and it is a very real issue for so many people and it is growing. So I'm grateful that uh, each and every one of you have come and that it gets shared. So I'm gonna share my screen and uh, take a little time to, uh, to sort of sh share what's happening from a statistics point of view, but also a story point of view. Um, like Jennifer said, this is presented by Two Steps Home, and that's a, a not-for-profit that's looking at uh, the solution to the gap in between encampments and shelters and housing. There's a bit of a gap. Uh, we have all these plots of land that we can't quite, we haven't built on yet. Um, we have folks who have uh, been living in an encampment or a shelter for a long time and, and need some transitional support before they can live on their own in uh, housing. And Two Steps Home is proposing to build little cabin communities uh, on plots of land that might be slated for development later, um, help people move in, wrap around supports around them, and then they move on. So it's not a end uh, of the line. We don't think that people should be living in tiny cabins. Um, it's Two Steps Home. It fills a gap. Um, and they asked me to uh, come on board as their faith outreach person. Um, as Jennifer had said, uh, one of the things I run is something called Contagious Hope. And I look at ways to get people in the pews out into the streets. Uh, and that's on a number of issues, homelessness uh, and the, uh, the unsheltered crisis being one of them. But also uh, I work in the spaces of 2SLGBTQ justice, uh, refugees, climate change. And I'm looking to find ways to network across all our uh, faith communities, very much like what you're doing with the Make a Difference. Um, so this is kind of the last year of some of the projects uh, I, I've gotten involved in. Um, in the top left corner, you see uh, um, Dominion Church. Uh, we've had a, a refugee crisis um, for a long time, but it has spilled out onto our streets literally with uh, African newcomers sleeping on the sidewalks and churches and mosques taking them in. In fact, that individual last night that called me at 9.30, I ended up sending them to the mosque in Weston because they have 15 people sleeping in their basement. And um, the beautiful souls there who are volunteers took in uh, that woman last night. Um, below that is a uh, a look at where some of the refugees have been housed in um, uh, in Vaughan, right, crammed into these tiny um, un, unheated spaces without washrooms and um, doing their best as churches to try to support folks. Uh, I also do some encampment work. I'm the volunteer associate minister at uh, St. Luke's where I was preaching this morning. And that's a photo uh, across the way at Allen Gardens in the bottom left corner. Um, we then also, I look at trying to do advocacy. So uh, um, among many other things that we sort of attend and sometimes do press conferences for, this was just standing in witness with the encampment clearing at St. Stephen's in the field, the, the middle picture that says, love thy neighbor. Um, and it's devastating because where do do folks go when we spend so much money on clearing them out of their spaces? Uh, 
Bell, uh, turning Bellwoods Park, for example, we spent almost a million dollars clearing those people out of their tents and their homes, um, only for them to disperse to other places because there was no place for them to go. Uh, and can you imagine if we'd spent that million instead of security and policing on on housing? The last one is um, is that mosque that I that I that I was telling you about um, that I sent someone to last night, and. Um, we had a love thy sheltered neighbor at Christmas for them because half of the folks staying there are Christian. And the ED of the mosque said, you know, Reverend Alexa, you know how to do Christmas. And so we organized uh, an event and everybody got gifts and gift cards. Um, and uh, so truly interfaith work. Um, so I want to focus in though for today on the crisis uh, of, of homelessness in our city. And as people of faith, we know that there is uh, a moral imperative, right? The, the passage that, that touches me most on a regular basis, it's one that um, I live by as best I can and fail regularly at, is this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a sibling in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us love with words, not, not just with words and speech, but also with action and in truth. So what does it mean um, to love our neighbors in a time like this? Here's what it looks like today. In Canada, the estimated number, and we're, we're, we don't know because lots of people are couch surfing and living in various places that are precarious, the estimated number is between 150 to 300,000 people, and that's rising. So that means that on any given night, there's 25 to 35,000 people who need a bed and who are homeless in our country of great wealth. And then if we focus into where we are today uh, in Takaronto, in Treaty 13, Toronto, we have the largest number of people who are homeless, uh, 19 thousand plus some people say it's closer to eleven thousand every single night and the shelters they say are at 98 percent occupancy but that actually means that most nights they're over capacity for example the individual that tried to get into the warming centers last night was turned away um we just went and uh, supported folks doing a press conference on friday where the kenyan woman died and the peel region uh, shelter is saying that they are at 400% capacity. November, when the other Nigerian gentleman died at that same shelter, they were at 300% capacity. That's a staggering jump from November to now to be at 400% over capacity. Um, Toronto's warming centers, uh, for example, are operating at around 120% capacity. So on the coldest nights of the year, we do not have enough space for those who need to come in. And then we've got uh, a backlog all the way down, right? 85,000 uh, plus families waiting on uh, the housing wait list. And so they can't get out of the shelter because there's no housing for them. So that crunches um, the, the the shelter and, and stresses that system. Uh, we were talking uh, just before we started that one in 10 Torontonians now are using a food bank. Um, and the, the, the folks that are coming to the food bank have changed in, in the, in their makeup. Uh, I work at one of the food banks and see a lot of young families. I see a lot of students. I saw a lot of employed people who simply cannot make ends meet without using the food bank. Um, so, and this is increasing. And then we do have a connection uh, between mental health and, and homelessness. And 75% of people who are living on our streets struggle with some sort of mental health illness. And some of them may have had that before they came and some have been exacerbated. Uh, the woman who, who was last night, they were told she was told she could go to 129 Peter Street and they might let her sleep in the lobby or be in the lobby. But the lobby lights are on. It's a concrete floor. Um, and that's where you'd have to be all night and then you'd be be out in the day. And, uh, you know, for, for, for many countries, that's actually listed as a form of torture to keep lights on in, and not let someone actually sleep properly. And yet we do that to a lot of our, our unhoused folks um, regularly. So if you don't get a good night's sleep, 
uh, then how do you keep well physically and mentally um, well? 10% uh, of, uh, of the folks that are that are sleeping rough are, are seniors and another 10% are youth. So that's what we're looking at when we when we see uh, people and we're looking at the stats. But um, people are not statistics, right? And um, I was working in a congregation a couple of years ago. And there was a gentleman named Nelson who had a two bedroom apartment with his son, who he shared custody with. His son was 11 and he worked in construction and he had an accident and he could no longer work. And he fell into uh, a depression trying to get work. And I stopped seeing him come regularly. And he eventually came to church and he said, uh, Reverend Alexa, I have lost my home. And I've put everything I own into a storage locker and I'm living out of my car and I'm using an Airbnb on the weekends that I have my son so that I can still see him. But I'm about to lose the Airbnb because I have no, or the air, the shelter that all my, the locker that all my stuff is in. Um, and he wouldn't come into the shelter because he didn't see himself as someone who uses the shelter. He lived in Bloor West in a two bedroom apartment and uh, he would rather live in his car, but he needed to secure his apartment furnishings so that he could try to get back on his feet. And I found somebody who, who offered to pay for a year for his storage locker, but that wasn't enough. He got occasional jobs because he had a car and he could do one day gigs on construction despite his knee being a problem. And the winter came and it was far too cold to sleep in a car. And eventually he came and slept on our sofa at my house for a couple of weeks. And we called every single day, multiple times a day. And it took two weeks before we got him a shelter bed. And he got into the system just as COVID hit and all the staff disappeared and worked from home for the most part. And he was incredibly lonely. And he'd call me late, late, late at night and say, this is hell, please, please help. And there was very little that I could do. He could no longer have his son for visits. His car got repossessed. His storage locker was there, but there was nowhere to put all those furnishings, those pictures of him and his son. And eight months later, I called and didn't get an answer. And I called again and didn't get an answer the next day. And then his son came to the church with his son's mother and let me know that he had died of depression, that he'd taken his life. And instead of doing a housewarming for him, I helped that 11-year-old boy find the right teddy bear to put in his father's coffin. And the truth is that most of us are closer to Nelson than we are to millionaires. Most of the city, most of Canada, 52% uh, are $200 away from not having enough money to pay their monthly bills. So this is a crisis and it's getting worse right now. Um, and it is something that affects each and every one of us. I suspect if I were to pause for a minute and ask that many of you have a story of someone who is struggling or know of a friend who has someone who is struggling. And this affects every one of our families in different ways in our church communities. And I think it's really important that we remember that behind every stat is a story. So I would be happy to hear your stories if you want. When we go to question time, if there's something you want to share, please do. The root causes, well, I think probably you know most of them. Um, poverty, lack of employment, lack of safety at home. We're, we're seeing in Alberta right now, the legislation that makes transgender children less safe. Um, and many of them will, will leave home and find themselves in that 10% of youth that are on the streets, family conflicts, um, disability is connected to, to housing uh, challenges, mental health, and of course, lack of affordable housing, right? Um, Cheryl Forchuk, who's a professor at the Arthur Labatt Family School of Nursing, she uses a fantastic metaphor 
for helping us understand this crisis that we're in. She uses the metaphor of musical chairs, right? We are all circling around these chairs. And when you're a kid and you're playing musical chair, the first kid out when the music stops is the kid who recently broke his leg and is, is, is hobbling around, right? And the second kid uh, out is the one who's a little more shy, a little less, a little less, more hesitant. And by the end of the musical chair, the strongest kid, the tallest kid is usually the one sitting on that chair. And the problem was never those kids. The problem was there were not enough chairs. The problem that we have is that there is not enough affordable housing. That's why we have a shelter crisis in our city. And those, um, I guess I would go back for a second and talk a little bit about the impacts, right? The impacts of that musical chair game that we're playing with people's lives is from a from a economic standpoint, it's about seven billion dollars annually to the cost of homelessness in Canada. But at a personal level, we've, we we I mentioned it a little bit already: mental health, physical health. Um, someone who's living in in poverty right now, and homelessness and poverty are quite deeply linked, has a life expectancy that's twenty to thirty years shorter than uh, the average Canadian. Um, the life expectancy of a homeless man is about 55 years and a homeless woman is about 42 years. That's the median age. Um, and people who are, uh, are homeless are at a greater risk of violence. For the, there's one third of people that were, were um, surveyed who were, were living out on the street had been hit, had been kicked, had been urinated on, had their stuff stolen. These are things that have not happened to most of us. And yet when you're out on the street, there's a lot of violence that you're exposed to. Um, when we had COVID, the numbers for those who were living on uh, outside, they were five times more likely to die than the average Canadian. So <clears throat> some of the, the very real impacts of, of homelessness. We've got lots of challenges to it. You probably, you know, heard them, right? Um, we have some stigmas and some misconceptions around uh, around homelessness and who is homeless and why they're homeless and and uh, you know whether it was something they they did or something they are, as opposed to that musical theater, musical chairs analogy of you no, know, the reason why we have people who are homeless is because we do not have enough adequate housing for everybody. Um, so lack of affordable housing is a huge part and there's a critical need. And we're seeing that, you know, the, the Canadian government has a housing plan. The city of Toronto has a housing plan. Those are really important plans and they are all falling short. When we look at the actual number of people who will be uh, still in need of housing, we are not hitting the targets that will actually meet the demands. So, you know, as people of faith, one of the things we can talk about later is advocacy and uh, and re you know, requiring that housing is a human right. The other uh, piece that we the challenge that we have is this financialization of housing, right? Housing has become a way that people um, people uh, accrue wealth, right? It's for profit. We buy a house. I have a mortgage, and when I sell it, it's going to be worth a whole lot more. And when it, we have a model of housing that is that is is for profit, then we fail sometimes to see that housing is a human right. And when we have a housing as a human right model, then everything shifts and that it is one of the basic needs that we must provide for every single individual and not just for those who can afford it. And of course the ongoing systemic, um, systemic challenges um, that perpetuate homelessness, including nimbyism, right? I had a wonderful woman say to me, somebody's moved into the park near me. What should I do? And I said, well, I think you should go and welcome your new neighbor because don't they have as much a right as you do to live in this city? And she did. She went and bought a hot chocolate and a coffee because she wasn't sure which one her new neighbor would prefer. And she became a neighbor to the person who was living in the park.
really briefly, and then, you know, you guys will let me know what you want to talk about in, in terms of our questions, but housing solutions, we, they are interconnected. There is no one size fits all. Um, it's a combination of, of um, different kinds of housing that are going to prove most effective. You can find out more about Toronto's programs if you go to the Housing TO strategy or the Toronto Poverty Relief uh, Reduction Strategy or the Toronto Resilience Strategy. And there's also one if you're interested in particularly in seniors, there's a Toronto Seniors Strategy um, because by 2031, one quarter of all Torontonians will be over 65. But some of the housing strategies that are used one is affordable housing initiatives, right? And we've seen that our our latest city budget has uh, has gone to to put towards some more money towards affordable housing and, and rent protection and other pieces. So the whole affordable housing initiative uh, is basically all about increasing affordable houses um, that accommodate individuals and risk and youth and and families that are at risk of homelessness. Then you can also part of that is is implementing rent control so that uh, the rent doesn't go up and people are out on the streets. And the third piece of of that affordable housing initiative is often developing uh, supportive housing programs that are combined with the affordable housing so that there's full wraparound services for those who need it. So not everybody is able to live uh, well and thrive on their own. Some folks need uh, uh, mental health support, uh, addictions treatments, job training. And so uh, a model that allows for the wraparound supports that an individual needs to thrive is really important. So we strengthen those social supports um, that are are in place at the, immediately, but we also look to the root causes of homelessness and try to uh, increase the social supports there. So mental health issues, substance abuse issues, domestic violence, enhancing outreach programs that can connect the individuals who are experiencing homelessness with the supports they need, including healthcare and counseling. Um, the St. Mike's Hospital has a phenomenal program that's all around social medicine and they are prescribing things like housing as part of uh, a person's treatment plan because they're seeing a direct co co correlation between someone's physical health and well-being and whether they are housed or not and so they they are seeing the need for housing um, as part of the solution to uh, to to someone's overall health um, we also talk about prevention programs, right? We, we, we want to not just be a band-aid and so much of what we do, uh, including in faith communities is band-aid treatments, right? Our out of the cold programs, our meal programs. Um, but it, it wouldn't be great if every time we decided to donate our time or, uh, our items, uh, we also made a call to our counselor and, and, and started to advocate for the policy changes that will actually allow people the access to the things they need to thrive so they don't have to depend on donations. Um, so preventative programs that we can advocate for, and I know that you guys have, have been doing some work on like guaranteed livable income or universal basic income, um, job training, and um, other ways that uh, we get emergency financial assistance, eviction prevention, those are all part of the ways that we can prevent people from winding up on the street. Um, we can also move instead of, um, uh, of, of an approach to housing that says you have to be all ready with your, your ducks lined up in a row to have housing. We can move to a housing first model. And the housing first model prioritizes rapid housing for people. Um, rather than um, requiring them to be sober or have a job or have a certain amount of money before they're housed. The Housing First says the primary response we need is, is housing, and then we wrap them around with, with the supports that they need at that time. Um, and Two Steps, which is, again, the, the not-for-profit that is putting this particular presentation together, is part of that solution in that gap between um, people who are encampments and people who are housing. It's very rapid housing. It takes six months, and we can get uh, a cabin community for 50 people built and in place. Um, 
And then the other piece that 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 is really, really important is community collaboration between government agencies, between not-for-profits, between businesses, between faith communities, um, to provide a rap a comprehensive coordinated response. The I was talking to uh, a, a family of refugees this morning at church, and they are in a uh, shelter hotel. And I heard from them the thing I'm hearing from so many of our African um, refugees, and that is that their stomachs are getting upset by the food that is being provided in the shelter because they've never eaten mayonnaise and uh, a lot of pasta and a lot of cheeses. And so we are not providing um, the culturally appropriate food, whereas the, the Black-led churches that were providing the shelters, um, they were doing an incredible job of caring specifically for the community that was there. So when we work together, right, when our city shelters work with our community organizations, that's just one example of how we can actually provide a welcome um, that is dignified and appropriate for folks. So collaboration is a really big piece because we can't, we can't solve this with just one fix. Um, and we're going to need, we're going to need all of us taking our particular role in it. I think that kind of brings me to the call to action piece, right? And this is where we can spend some time thinking about and and diving deeper. Um, Isaiah 58 is the other passage that I tend to lean very heavily on when I'm having a down day. And that is um, God saying to the people, if you spend yourself on behalf of the hungry and you satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and you will be called repairers of broken walls, restorers of the streets with dwellings. And faith communities have been repairers of the breach for centuries. In the recent decades, the Out of the Cold program, refugee settlement, places like Fred Victor and the Salvation Army were originally started by, with faith-based groups, and then they got picked up um, by the city and supported. The refugee crisis that we've had in our streets this, this past year, seven churches and mosques, one mosque, were the ones who responded to it. So faith communities, you know, are often on the front lines. Um, and there are many opportunities for groups like ours here to, to make a difference, either by becoming involved directly in one of those programs or advocating through Faith in the City or the Interfaith Coalition to End Homelessness, by getting involved with local food banks, housing programs, Two Steps Home that we're working on, uh, Contagious Hope, that is another part of the product work that I do, or local church outreach. Um, and I think that it's um, it's really important to remember that we, we don't do it alone, because one of the things I'm seeing is a lot of our church communities uh, have smaller numbers and fewer volunteers, but there's one or two that are passionate about housing, and they don't have necessarily enough of a, of a critical mass. So how do we reach out across the sectors and across the faith groups and communities and come together because it's not just where two or three are gathered that God is there, but where two or three are gathered, miracles and transformation is possible. So I'm really interested in finding ways. And I'm really curious about your group because you've got already this place where, where churches and mosques and faith groups are coming together. Um, and how can we expand that and make sure that every one of us who is made in the image of the divine, who has a purpose, um, can connect in and network with where our particular gifts will be most useful. So I think I will um, pause there and see if there are questions and comments and um, we can dive deeper into one of those areas or we can go in a slightly different direction. Where's your heart uh, leading you and where's your head guiding you with some questions. So
So what St. Mike's has done is they've actually partnered um, and I, and I've forgotten the, how the partnerships all work, uh -huh. but with, on, on a, and to get a piece of property and they're looking at getting in the housing business because yeah, you can't just put it on a piece of paper and, uh, and, and prescribe it. Mm -hmm. So people are saying, wait, 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 doctors are getting involved in building housing. And, and they're saying, of course, right. Mm -hmm. If you are five times more likely to die of COVID because you live outside, mm -hmm. right. Then, then housing is key to health. Yeah. If you are, if you are, you know, if your life expectancy is dramatically decreased by 20 to 30 years, mm -hmm. um, that's a health issue mm -hmm. and housing seems to be key to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Dr. Andrew uh, Bozeri and Dr. Yeah, Stephen um, Wang, they are two of the doctors working on that, that you can um, Google and connect to. And I've heard Dr. Bozeri, he's very, mm -hmm. very good, yeah. Yeah. And I think Quam McKenzie did a lot when he was at CAMH. Yes. Um, yeah. But yeah. It, that's, that seems to be one of the biggest things. I mean, buying, well, I don't know. I'll ask you one, one other question, which is, Please. are you optimistic about the new city hall government and um, the idea of the city getting into building and not relying on developers? Yeah. Um, I, I, what, what I'm going to say is, is the housing now sites, that we put forward five mm -hmm. years ago mm -hmm. still haven't got shovels in the ground right so we have a problem mm -hmm. um we have sites we have a plan you know there's supposed to be funding and we seem to not be able to get shovels in the ground so part of why two steps home and someone was saying that they just saw khalil right Khalil, yeah. Is, yeah, that's right. So Khalil is uh, the gentleman who who built those shelters, those tiny homes in the parks that the city came along and put in dumpsters and uh, and sued him. And uh, he's partnered with John Van Ostrin, who's a, an architect that's done housing, affordable housing all over the world. And they've also partnered with uh, Sheila Penny, who was the CEO of um, of uh, Toronto Community Housing. And the three of them are are voluntary board members of Two Steps Home. And they're saying, look, if those housing now sites are there, in six months, we can get a cabin community and people can live and be supported mm -hmm. and then, you know, and 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 transition. So I'm I I see that there's a, a problem. I do feel more optimistic than I have in years with the new council, with the new mayor, with the uh just over a million dollars worth of new initiatives and enhancements to social services that this last budget um, came up with. Mm -hmm. But I think that they are going to face tremendous pressure and challenges and where we can support, uh, we should. Sometimes we get thinking that, oh, we've got a progressive uh, group in there, mm -hmm. can relax. And Meanwhile, the lobbyists on the other side, the developers and those who are not looking at affordable housing, they don't relax. They come in and they hammer hard. So in this last budget, um, the police were in every single day talking to all the councillors. They put used lots of money to put up ads to get that $12 million. And those of us who wanted to see the social services supported, because we know when you 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 support a family early, there's less crime later. Right. And uh, well, while we didn't lose any funding, um, we did see the police gain that 12 million. So I think I'm optimistic, but I'm I'm realistic, too, that we actually still need to be there and we still need to write our letters and we need to give them uh, the pressure that they need. And it's good pressure. Right. It's allyship kind of thing. Uh, but they need to hear. Mm -hmm. that we really need this to happen mm -hmm. um, that we can't let up because we think that we've got a progressive mayor in the in at the helm yes i do and that's why i partnered with with two steps instead of some of the other possible models out there there are some models that would do it cheaper uh, and there's some models that do it with volunteer labor and all of these pieces but john van Osten being an architect um, they are building these these cabin communities to code so that a city can say yes. 
Um, they've built them with uh, recyclable and uh, like a decreased carbon footprint. And uh, they built them with character because they know that people are living there, right? You put someone in a box and you tell that person that they're warehoused, right? You put them in something with a bit of an A-frame and a window and you say you're housed. So whether or not in the end, um, you know, uh, that piece of architect will last. Sometimes it gets whittled away as as budgets, you know. But I'm pushing for for making these things, these the cabin communities, exactly that, you know, to code and uh, and livable. And what's what's nice about these is that they are transferable. So they you put them down, and because they're built to code and they're built strong, uh, they can be picked up and they will be picked up and moved to the next site. So when people move into the location that they were waiting for, then these get picked up and they get moved and they can be used again and again. And again, something that's built sort of a little bit haphazardly um, is going to fall apart and is not going to be able to be reused again and again and again. Um, so I, I agree with you and, and two steps agrees that we don't want a, more slums. We don't want this to be the end. So the partner that they're looking for, whether it's a church property or whether it's city land is a partner that they also have, a uh, a, a trajectory to permanent housing with, right. Um, so that we, we don't see people stuck like we see them in the shelters right now. gets your city councilor um and and emails and a phone call and even asking for a meeting about what's happening there and getting a few neighbors together and going and saying we'd love to have a meeting to talk to you about how do we get this supported because they're getting meetings from the neighbors that are saying don't you dare put it here absolutely and 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 so you know you can absolutely write both your uh, your provincial um, MPP and your city, uh, but I think your city councilor is going to know where that where it's stuck and where where your energy could be best used. It's a really great question, and, and when we're talking about faith communities, one of the things I wonder about is what our role can be uh, around. We have this incredible network. Right. And we have this in, in terms of uh, the various denominations that we're a part of, uh, the fact that everyone in our in our own community is connected to family members that might be scattered in other neighborhoods. So I think we have an important role to play in fighting NIMBYism. And I don't always I haven't quite sort of I see some of the ways that our networks can do that. But I would love to see us do that you know, even more like, like along the lines of the basic livable income has become kind of a big project across the United Church. Can we create um, networks across the city that then start to weave um, some of this work into neighborhoods that might not be yet tapped? So part of uh, my job as outreach with two steps is when we identify a particular neighborhood that we might be moving that cabin community in, um, can we go in and and get some support from the community uh, and and work against those who might be have fears or questions and you know get them on board ahead of time so that people aren't surprised by a new housing um, and that's usually when it goes really really poorly and I think that our faith communities could be doing more of this if we were better networked to each other. So you have this wisdom at, at Bloor Street that you've work, worked on and walked with for some time. And if we could, you know, have more relationships with churches in Etobicoke and some of those that can cut that information that you've learned can be kind of transferred over to those groups. I think that there's ways in which for me, uh, I can give you all the statistics in the world, but I think relationships really change minds. Um, that it's when you when you talk to someone and you get to know them and you trust them and then they have a different opinion than you and you your mind is changed. So I think we have a we we have a really great network that we don't use as well as we could. 
um, which is part of the contagious hope stuff that I want to do is, is, is networking people all across the city and sharing resources and information and, and enthusiasm for different projects. So I don't know if that really answered because it, it is a tough nut, right? To figure out we're so siloed um, and we're so boundaried and yet faith communities are one of the few places where we cross over into lots of spaces and have, you know, an open door to, to another group um, if we were to find ways to, to access it. No, um, I, I don't mm -hmm. um, because I just want to be useful. I want the gifts that I have to be useful. And I find that when I work into these spaces, mm -hmm. I that need in me um, to, to, to use my gifts and services met. So in that way, I'm, I'm very, I'm very hopeful. Mm -hmm. um, I also see so many people out there who want to help, but don't know how. Yeah, and that's a big piece. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and as we, uh, again, this is, more in the United Church piece, but as we broke apart presbyteries and moved to regions, we we lost some of those networks. Mm -hmm. Also, as as churches declined, they let go of some of the outreach that they used to do and networking that they used to do to focus on um, managing the resources that they had in their building or in their smaller congregations. The same happened at the denominational level. All these um, interfaith groups that had funding to that they would fund an individual who would network them around issues that funding is declining as well um and so in that sense i feel like i'm a bit alone in that there's not as many people doing it but i'm not alone in interest everyone i talk to says this is we really need to be doing this um and i have you know 200 plus on the on a on a newsletter for homelessness issues and when we did a uh, to us LGBTQ statement of solidarity in June, we got 500 faith communities from all kinds of different denominations across Ontario within a few days mm. signed onto that statement. So I think that there's a there's a, a, a will for that. Um, I'm still figuring out how to fund all of that, which is is an interesting kind of space to be in, being very faithful and feeling like this is this is an important piece that I can offer of ministry but it's not a congregation. So it doesn't fit in the structures of the church. So how does it get supported? Mm -hmm. um, but the good work that's done, you know, there was a church that, that brought in 12 refugees and just gave them a place to stay because they, they couldn't give them more. They were kind of in a warehouse and they weren't there Monday to Friday. Mm -hmm. And these refugees called me after three, four days saying they had nothing to eat. And they had a bag of potatoes that morning dropped off and that was it. And I was able to surround them with the five local churches in North Etobicoke. And those churches, you know, brought food, took the women out to buy bras at Walmart, like just got these, these, the support. And I just think that's amazing, right? Mm -hmm. They wanted to support, they didn't know how. Mm -hmm. And so can we find ways to build this network that uh lets each other know what we're doing and how we can work and those of us interested in refugees work here and those of us interested in housing work here those of us interested in 2s lgbt right relations right mm -hmm. and we just start to weave more and more people into these groups mm -hmm. um and then we're a powerful voice at the table right that's the other thing i've noticed in the last year of doing this work so i left congregational ministry and 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 through a few little contracts and some support have been doing this and I'm sitting in the in city councilors' offices regularly and talking with MPs regularly and MPPs. And they're saying, can you bring the faith voice out for this? Or can you help us push on basic livable income? Or can you help us push on shelters, right? There is, there is a, a need for people power. And we can be part of the coalition of, of folks, one voice at the table. Uh, you know, with lots of humility around that, that we're one voice at the table, but we are a powerful voice when we're all together. So I had 177 faith leaders sign the a letter in November when that refugee was died outside of the cold. And um, 
you know, we held a press conference and the Mark Miller, the immigration minister that afternoon responded in another press conference. He got asked a question about our press conference. So there's, there's really interesting possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, but if we do it together, right. And, and we do it in an interfaith manner and we do it with uh, our secular um, support social service agencies as well. It was something that um, was done in churches every Sunday. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In synagogues on Fridays and Saturdays. And yeah. and we don't have that no. space. And in fact, we're seeing a link between the decline in church and faith-based attendance and the decline in giving. Yeah. Right? That in a moral get, sense. You know? Yeah. Where do we get that teaching of, yeah. of caring for and the common good? Yeah. Um, so warming centers come to mind because they are low barrier, which means the city lowers the standards of what you need to have a warming center. You're, uh, if it's, you have a shower, great, but it doesn't necessarily have to have a shower. And what's what's interesting about a warming center is that it's only open when the temperature hits a certain number. Right now it's negative five. Um, the challenge of that is it can hit negative five on a Thursday when choir practice is on, or it can hit ne you know, negative five on a Sunday. So a lot of churches, you know, turn down that notion, even though they have the space for 25 people or 50 people to come and put some cots out and the city pays market rent. So it's a, actually a really great deal for a church because you, you're, you're not, you're not running it, you're not staffing it, but you're providing a ministry that's really critical uh, at a time where people might die. Um, but because of its unpredictable nature, it has to be a space that's available. Uh, so, you know, could you prioritize a space? Or it would actually be rented to the city of Toronto? Yeah, the city pays for it, it. warming centers. You know, oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. They pay market rent for warming centers and for shelters. Um, and so it can actually help with the rest of your ministries, right? You can take that money and put it into another you know, your right relations ministry or whatever you'd like. And by, by, by giving the city that space for those five to six months that, you know, the warming centers might be opening and closing. Um, can you move your choir on, if it does happen to be on a Thursday night to the sanctuary? Can you, you know, can you think creatively around, around that? Um, and we've seen the numbers of food banks and things like that going up. So, what about if one of your one of your spaces is one day a week don donated to the daily bread for a dollar a month or for nothing? They come in and they do the whole ministry because that's the other thing that churches are struggling with is, well, we don't have the volunteers to actually run it. But can you give the space to the, to the city or the social services that run it? Could you commit to being a place where, you know, one day a week people come and um, I'll tell you a story, a really brief story about that is, is we got asked at Windermere United to be a food bank in the pandemic because we were, we had a little bit food pantry and, um, we're not accessible. And so I said, you know, we're not accessible, but the Catholic church on Bloor street is, and I called the priest up and I said, would you be interested in willing? And he was, and it was amazing. And, and I had created these mutual networks mutual aid networks and I said I can give you one of the pods in Bloor West they're interested they can come and help you and run it and they're still running it to this day and what I find so moving about that is in Bloor West which is you know one of the the most wealthiest affluent neighborhoods it's I think it's like got number one in Toronto life for livability and stuff on Bloor Street every Friday there is a lineup of about a hundred and something people coming to get food mm -hmm. and it's changed the conversation in the neighborhood and it's changed the conversation at that church. Right. Um, and I think that can be some very powerful ministry when you can't, when you can't run a program yourself, can you set aside space? St. Luke's is, is looking at that now in their redevelopment that they are making sure that the, that there'll be space for food banks some right relations work, uh, their outreach program that they run, um like it's all part of the and and you know and some of that stuff they won't be running because they don't have capacity mm -hmm. so i think that your your ministry of space is a really important one 
And there's lots of ways you can do it, even with a few volunteers. You know, could you house a refugee settlement group that comes in Friday mornings and meets lawyers um, or does English as a second language? Uh, hmm. So it might be an expansion of that. That might be a right fit, right? Because I also think that we all, we don't have to do everything. That that there is, and again, part of this network idea is that each one of us, I used to run a program called Stone Soup, right? Each one of us brings our potato, our onion, our particular gift, and suddenly there's an abundance. We don't have to do the whole thing. So what is it that Bloor Street is called to, given the makeup of who's there and the place that they're located? Um, there can be very powerful ministry happening when all the right pieces are put in place. You know, that's when miracles happen. Not yet in Toronto, but the city's uh, staff are supposed to bring a report uh, in the spring to the city about uh -huh. the viability of them and, and putting them into their capital campaign. Uh, and But they are in, uh, there's a little one in Hamilton. They are in Kitchener-Waterloo. Uh, there was one in, in uh, the Kingston area. Halifax has made the news about putting together a cabin community. Um, and so... It is a it is a model, and the U.S. has some cabin communities, and again, it's uh, you see very different versions of it based on um, who's creating them and where their priorities are around them. Um, so uh, we'll see how Toronto decides their cabin communities um, need to be, but they don't. We don't have any yet. Right. Mm -hmm. The closest thing we had was the stuff that, that Khalil was building and people in the city destroyed. There are a couple of in, um, indigenous um, land settlements sort of, but they're, and they are around off around sacred fires. So there's one in Regent Park, there's one in Allen Gardens now. And the city is, is thus far uh, honoring that, uh, those little communities. So Allen Gardens has had, almost all the tents taken out it was very it was very upsetting for a lot of people um the the city councilor there uh was quite negative about about the encampment that was there um and they've slowly worked to get everybody housed which is great but they also worked very hard to not let a single person come in which was not great um so you know if you did get a new put up a new tent they took it out um and they put a tremendous amount of security and and the the folks that that were in that picture that I was with you know they felt under surveillance 24 7 and when um when the security would walk by they would go into their tents and be like we can't be here right now you know it's just too upsetting um but they've left the indigenous uh tp that's there and the sacred fire that's there um so I don't know. I think there's also some possibilities there around working with our Indigenous uh, partners around land use and what does it mean um, to own land and who is it for and um, and and pieces like that that our, our philosophies and and ways of being right. Can we learn something and uh, and and meld what was it you know the colonial mindset with a very different way of, of looking at land. Um, can we learn from them? And that's another place where churches could be, you know, leaders in, in doing the civic, the civic education, right? And the teaching, giving space over for our elders to teach, right? Our earliest apostles shared everything in common. They made sure that no one went without and that's how they survived as early Christians. Um, so we could reclaim some of that and dig deeper into that theology. Uh, and I think that would do a lot in our communities too, to think differently about what it means, to, what ownership is for and who it's for. I think that two steps home is not looking at a model of sort of civic disobedience or initiative uh, and moving in it's looking at partnerships um but but it's not necessarily tied to the city so you know we could be having a conversation with a with a church with a massive parking lot or a piece of land um or a church that's you know merged with another church and wants to have a second campus right 
There, are, there We are not at all short of spaces. Um, there are thousands of empty condominiums right now. There are office buildings that are empty. Um, what we are short of is imagination and will right now. Um, and a big part of that is 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 honestly because um, our empathy's gone. Like we 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 if we if you if you if you got the phone call I got last night at nine thirty at night, um, you couldn't keep ignoring um, the need, and and I think that our church spaces, our storytelling spaces, our spaces where you know morality and ethics get discussed. Um, but we also talk about relationships. So I think we're in a really, really important place uh, to make sure that we keep these conversations live and happening, you know, Sundays, but also through the week, um, because it's all possible. It's all doable. There's buildings, there's sites, right? You were talking about being in Parkdale. Remember the old Hughes room? It's supposed to be a men's shelter and it's stalled. It's years and years and years stalled now, right? So we, yeah, we have the spaces. Um, we do need more advocacy. Every single subway could be built above it. The city owns that property. They could just be building a tower above a subway, right? There are all kinds of creative ideas out there. Yeah. No. So tell your story. Right. And share and celebrate those parts, especially the parts of it, you know, that you feel are relevant to your ministry, um, mm -hmm. because we need inspiration and we get and, and too often we hear we can't do it. And here's why we can't do it. And I think we need people of vision to hold up the vision of what we are called to and what we can do. So much of what we're we're looking at right now is division and and dis and describing ourselves by who and what we're against. So, you know, Bloor Street, tell the story and celebrate the story and hold that light for other congregations um, to come towards, because right now there's just a lack of vision in our world. And you reminded me that that something we didn't talk about is land trusts and um, the way in which the city is moving in that direction as one of the other solutions, right? I'm familiar to with buy that. up the land that that is available and keep it at affordable rates. So I think I'm going to wrap it up now and say thank you so much, Alexa, and everybody who came and listened to this talk. And we will post it on YouTube. So we'll share the link, share it with all your friends. If the point is networking, share it with all your networks. And uh, yeah. maybe we can spread uh, interest in this talk. And you can always also send ideas for future speakers. Um, although we haven't had any trouble filling the slate. There is so much good work going on in, in, in the city and in the world.